Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Natalie Serino. Natalie is one of the co-founders of Gimlet Labs, which is a company that is doing computer vision for the edge. That's right. Thanks, Spencer. So tell me a little bit more about what Gimlet Labs is doing. So um, I guess you guys met at Stanford and sort of broke out your research into this company. Um, what's, what's your guys's I guess maybe not your secret sauce, but like, what do you guys bring into the table? Yeah, for sure. So I think that, you know, when I was a visiting scholar at Stanford, I was looking into the problem of observing machine learning models in edge environments, because a lot of times there can be a problem about you have some model and it's deployed to an edge environment and something is going wrong. The model's incorrect. And a lot of times it can be very difficult to understand why that's happening. It could be related to the fact that the camera is configured wrong. It could be related to the fact that the data that the model is seeing is different than the data it was trained on. It could be related to skew where maybe something's changed about the world around you and you need to actually update the model to have that information. And I think that one of the challenges with edge systems is that there can be very limited visibility into what's happening compared to some cloud environment. And the experts in that device or in that model are not necessarily co-located with it. And so you have some other person on the other end of it who doesn't have the context about why it might be failing. Um, actually, I was talking to someone who works in factory robotics who was saying that a very large proportion of the time these robots are failing. and it's difficult for the operators to know why. So that was what kind of started the problem on an academic perspective. But then as we looked more and more into it, it seemed as though there were even more fundamental problems with running computer vision models specifically at the edge than even observing them. Just getting them up and running and working on a particular edge device, which might be highly constrained, uh, that was a really large burden for people even the day zero issues and when you say and constrained, so, you mean like computationally computationally but it also could be in terms of you know like yeah it could be in terms of like compute like maybe you don't have the right type of chip but you also might be lacking memory you might be lacking power you might be even lacking network connectivity if you have like a hybrid execution model and so i think that Meaning it's like all part well of it good. happens on a data center and part of it happens at the edge that's right. And, okay. you know, the data center might be co-located, you know, with their edge device. It might be in the cloud somewhere. You know, there's many different models that people have. But I think that, you know, I think at least on the software side of things, we've all focused a lot on the cloud and running things in the cloud. And it works on my machine. But running something on completely different hardware than what it was trained on is just a different beast. And so what we found as we talked to more and more people was that a lot of those day zero problems were really getting them as well. And that was sort of what inspired us to start this company. And what we're trying to do with Gimlet is basically say, OK, like how do we really leverage our knowledge in AI and in edge devices in order to make it easier for builders like developers to create these AI models that they can integrate into their systems. And so our thinking is that basically they should be able to tell us with a simple text prompt what they want to do. Like I want to detect shopping carts. I want to detect products from this catalog. I want to detect, you know, if my, you know, production of, you know, some thing is like producing defective results. So is this like and, a binary question or is this like, you know, show me where the thing's at if it fits in that category? It can be, it could be either of those, okay. right? I think that it should be flexible to something that the human understands. And then at that point, it becomes our problem to generate the model for that use case that will work on their device. 
Well, that's pretty cool that you can just delegate all that pesky engineering to Gimlet Labs. Well, you know, obviously we're still early, but we've seen some kind of promising results where, you know, it doesn't work on every single hardware on day one, right? But we huh. can work on multiple different kinds of devices. And the real game changer, I think, on the generating the model side has been vision transformer models. You know, we've all heard of chat GPT and large language models and vision transformers are sort of a extension of that applied to image data. And the thing about vision transformers is they have like very flexible knowledge of the world, but they're larger and expensive to execute and often not suited for edge devices. So what we do in Gimlet is we actually distill knowledge from those vision transformers to a smaller model that learns almost like the vision transformer model is a teacher. And that's how we're able to generate these models on behalf of the user. So I, I asked kind of when we were warming up and I'll, I'll bring it up again, even though I know that I'm wrong, but do you guys have issues with like overfitting to synthetic data? Yeah. So I think that, you know, we don't currently use synthetic data for training right now. We'll use just like publicly available data sets cool. and you can actually get pretty far for the, with those for certain use cases. Um, we're also going to be using data from someone's device or something like that. And so one thing that's kind of interesting about overfitting is that if you only train on data from your specific device, it will definitely learn an overfit representation of the world. But there is an advantage to that too, where that model is actually a lot more efficient. Yeah, it makes a lot and of so sense. It, yeah, so if it only sees that world, it's <laughs> yeah. good. Right. So yeah, I think that the concept of overfitting is important. And so that's where like you always want to be retraining models, right? Like you need to constantly be updating them and maintaining them just like you would any other code. I think right now we're in a paradigm that's like waterfall based where you spend all this time building a model, you release it and then it's done. But in reality, Forever. that model needs to continue to evolve. That's like the chat GPT disclaimer or the like doesn't know anything about news after 2021 or, or whatever. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. And so like, you know, with Gimlet, what we want to do is use these publicly available data sets or possibly data from your device in order to bootstrap the initial model. But then once it's deployed, we want to be continuously learning on the data that your devices are seeing to make them better and better for your use case. So how do you do that if the device doesn't have an internet connection? Or I'm assuming maybe that that's a false assumption on my part. Yeah. So um, I think that, you know, like I said, we're still early, so we're still building a lot of this stuff. But the idea will be that the uh, side of it that can train models and like, you know, kind of manage the system, it is portable. We've designed it so that you don't have to actually run everything in the cloud necessarily. And we're designing it for intermittent connectivity as well. So to some extent, you know, we started a few months ago, to be honest with you. So sure. some of these things we're still building out. But no problem. Uh, yeah, I think that a lot of use cases involve having your compute in like some kind of data center that's co-located with your factory, for example, or your retail store. And, you know, if you're on a farm somewhere, too, you know, you might have a private 5G network rather than like some perfect Wi-Fi connectivity. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. When it sounds like you can run it on a local node too, so even if you don't have internet access, as long as you've got a site LAN, like that's enough to to make your product work. Yeah, that's right. And I think that like this is the kind of thing that comes up with edge environments that the cloud environments just don't have to worry about. It's a completely different world out there on the edge. Collaborative with Spencer Kraus is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at www.ska.solutions. I'm assuming uh, it kind of goes without saying based on what we're talking about, but this only works for like machine learning based uh, image algorithms. Like this doesn't work for classical computer vision because you don't need a training set. Yeah, that's right. I, we're focused on the kind of AI side of things. Um, I think that, you know, there's obviously a lot of value in the traditional computer vision techniques as well. I mean, I think that like most of our factories are built on those techniques. So yeah, those are, those are also good, but yeah, it just depends I mean, on the task really. <laughs> like what the yeah, that's is. right. I mean, I think something that you know, like, I think we were talking like earlier, like about things like facial recognition and product detection and things like that. And that's something that 
uh, these kind of AI based ways are really good at. And you were starting to explain to me actually um, how some of the AI based facial recognition works because I'm such an old man. I was still thinking about like anchor point ratios, like, you know, the mathematical relations between the distance between your eyes and your nostrils. Cause I think that's how they used to do it back when I went to school. Um, but it sounds like that's really out of date now. So I'd be curious, like, how does it work these days? Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, in the AI side of things, you often hear about people talking about embeddings, which is kind of like a fancy word for vector, honestly. Okay. And basically what these embeddings are is a machine learned representation of some kind of entity. Like you'll have embeddings that represent sentiment in a sentence. Like, does it seem like this person's positive or negative? You'll That's have embeddings. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's super cool. And you know, it's cool because it's sort of like the emergent property of what the model has learned. And it may be something that we can kind of reverse engineer, but it's not our native language, so to speak. And so, you know, for facial recognition, you know, you might think like, huh, like there's billions of people in the world and these models can work even if they've never seen a certain face before. And that's because the model has learned how to kind of differentiate faces from each other using these embeddings. And it doesn't have to actually have examples of every single face to recognize this is person one and this is person two. It basically learned how to, you know, use its architecture to generate this embedding representation of a face. And then it can kind of figure out when I look at an image and I generate that embedding, like, you know, which face do I know of that it's closest to? That's really interesting. Yeah. And so we took that as inspiration for the way that we built out a product recognition pipeline in Gimlet, where we distilled from the vision transformer the knowledge of how to detect products. And once you do that, you can actually have an embedding that gets generated when the model detects products. And then that embedding can be used in the same way to cross-reference against a catalog. So it can recognize products that it's never been trained on as long as it has access to a catalog. So if I'm understanding correctly, and I may not be because not not an AI expert, but try and one product, one embedding, um, and then you have some kind of a data structure that then has an embedding for each product in a catalog. And then you check against that more or less is what it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, you're kind of looking for like, you know, in this n dimensional space, like which one's my nearest neighbor? Okay, cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And like, I'm sure based on the lighting or the white balance or, you know, all these other confounding variables that we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, yeah. your embedding that you get from looking at that product through your camera might be a little different than the one you got from it, you know, an hour ago from a different angle under different lighting. There's two <laughs> things that can help with that. So like one of them is that, you know, if you have like a couple examples, you know, in your catalog that can help because, you know, you could have multiple neighbors as potential nearest ones for that object. But the other thing is that you really want to make sure that your model is generating good embeddings. And that's something it can be trained to do where if it generates embeddings that are super dependent on the lighting conditions or something like that, but that's probably something that you can work on your model to be more independent of those things. And, you know, if you think about it, like as a person, I can still detect like Tide pods from, you know, some detergent thing with my eye, even if the lighting is super yellow or whatever. Yeah. And so it should theoretically also be equally possible for a model generating embeddings to do that too. That's interesting. I mean, and then I would also think like, you know, like, I don't know, a person wearing makeup might look different than a person wearing different makeup or not wearing makeup. Or like right. if they've got like a zit on their face or like, you know, if you've taken a bottle of Tide and dragged it, you know, behind a car <laughs> for half a mile, and abraded right. the side of it, you know, maybe that right. maybe that's appears to be a different thing. And there does come a point where it's unrecognizable. I mean, if you, right. you know, do me up with so much makeup that I look like a Lord of the Rings character, like I might <laughs> not be recognizable by my cell phone when I'm trying to unlock it. But, you know, like, I don't know, like, does that do you do you really worry about those edge cases or is that so far off that you're like, we're probably not going to get a beat up product to the point where we can't tell, tell what it actually is. Well, I mean, I think those are important cases because especially in edge environments, like going from 90% accurate to 99% accurate to 99.9% .9 accurate is a huge difference. 
Yeah, and sure that. something that's only ninety percent accurate might be like completely unusable in practice. Yeah, but I mean, like even a person might not be ninety nine point nine percent accurate. Like if you ask me to recognize something that you've painted a different color and right. drawn a competitor's logo onto, like I might not know that it's a counterfeit or like that it's not the thing that is under all that paint. Yeah, and I think models have the potential to, and in a lot of use cases, they are you know better than human accuracy, right? But I think that, you know, in order to kind of like mitigate the use cases that you're talking about, it all comes down to generating the right embeddings and training the model to learn like, okay, when I'm looking at a face, you know, the model needs to have examples of people with makeup and things like that. Yeah. And that helps it discern what are the features that are actually relevant. Yeah. Does it matter the cheek color? No, it matters much more like the distance between the eyes or something like that. And it's not like these things are explicitly taught to the model, but you know, it can, it can kind of learn what are the right things to prioritize by seeing enough examples. And then interestingly enough, it converges on the classical way of doing it, but. Right. Yeah. I'm sure that <laughs> model does learn a lot of those things that we already explicitly knew. But the other thing is that it probably learns things that we might not have even thought about before. Interesting. Do you have any examples or is that like too hard to put into words? Yeah. I don't have a specific example, but you know, I think that that's why people talk about these models being like a black box or something like that. Sure. I think it's not as like big of a thing as you might say, because you can inspect what's happening. You can understand like what pixels trigger a certain result or where the attention of the model is focused. That's interesting. Um, yeah, you see these like really funny things actually where they'll like change like one single pixel to get the model to output a completely different result. Oh, and wow. so there's a lot of like funny things around that where people can kind of figure out exactly how to mess with the data to produce like very surprising results to the human eye. When I was at Case Western, um, I was engineering undecided. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I think the grad school equivalent of that was just called robotics. But um, basically, um, they made me take this intro to programming class and it was all in Java. And I, I, I like aced it you know, in a way that was pretty, pretty fun. And then there was this data structures class. I can't remember why I took the data structures class. I think I might've just like, like the professor might've like made me do it because I did so well on the other class or like maybe I was just looking for an easy A or like, anyway, I like ended up getting along with the professor and he like hired me as like the first undergrad he ever hired. And I was like, ah, I guess I'm kind of good at this. So I ended up getting a computer science degree, but then I went the other way with it and was like, I'm never going to do software again. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah because yeah. i think for me I, although i love my software class the thing that just really bothered me about it was like i understand that i can type into this text file basically and execute a program but like how does the hardware turn that into zeros and ones because i had heard that everything in a computer is zeros and ones and i just didn't i was like i need to understand like how that could possibly be true and so then i did computer engineering because i needed oh, to cool. know like i type this thing you know it goes into a compiler, that compiler, you know, produces an executable, that executable runs on my chip. Like I needed to know all the way down how it worked because it just seemed way too insane to take at face value. Although I had to say, once I got to analog circuits, I was kind of like, okay, I can accept the abstraction from here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, at a certain point, you can't be an expert on everything, right? And so... I, yeah, I kind of went down that like, rabbit hole too when I was an undergrad was like I started taking architecture courses and yeah. I took it up to grad school level and I'm like, okay, this is enough. You know, I had like a really like, good I, professor for like the architecture 101 and then I had kind of a crappy one for the more advanced one. So I still did right. well in the course, but I was like less interested and I'm like, all right, time to do something else. Yeah, I just remember like making a calculator out of chips in the lab and it was just one of the most like mind-blowing experiences I ever had in education. And so, yeah, I definitely still have love for hardware, even though, you know, I work more on the software side these days because I think that hardware is where you have to deal with the reality of the situation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, software too, but, you know, they, they're kind of uh, symbiotic, I guess. Yeah. Where you had to make the calculator with chips in the lab, was that an analog circuits class or what was that? I think it was, it was called digital, digital electronics yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was really good. And just seeing it be correct 
you know, as I tried more and more numbers, yeah. like, it's like, wow, this really does work. That's awesome. I was, um, I would do that like in the margins of my notebook. I was like writing logic gates and like trying to figure out calculators and different schematics. But that's because I think I wished I was in classes like you were in and I was like in business ethics and I was like, huh. I wonder if I could design a calculator that in theory would work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess business ethics is good too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the class was a little bit hokey. I, I think it could have been executed better, but I had a really, really good ethics class in grad school, which made me like it again. Although I heard Definitely someone said that- to act ethically. <laughs> Sorry. I heard that like professors of ethics are like less likely to be ethical than other professors or something like that. I don't know if it's like some bullshit study or something. So like, don't quote me on it, but- Yeah, I'm kind of wondering kind like of... what, who did that study? <laughs> but... Yeah, it's like, you know, the authors of this study are of course the most ethical. Yeah, the authors of this study, um, like what, what department hates ethics? Like the mathematics department. <laughs> right, like... right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They are consistently rated as the most ethical by whatever criteria I generated for it. Yeah. I, I'm just imagining like leaving a wallet with an ID and a hundred bucks in it. <laughs> like, you know, just filming that's right. you know, whatever happens. <laughs> like, that's... Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. I guess uh, that would, yeah, that might associate like which professors can get the most lucrative side gigs. Yeah, which professors are the least well paid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Makes sense to me. Yeah, my my undergrad ethics course was kind of just like, uh, it was supposed, it was kind of like, it felt like it was like memorizing like the uh, professor's opinions about different pieces in the news about like malfeasance. And yeah. so that, I don't know, I didn't really enjoy it because it, it just felt like memorization and regurgitation. But then the one I had in grad school was really interesting because it got a lot more abstract and like into the philosophy of ethics and like the right. trolley problem and, you know, some of that, you know, kind of like, how do you handle this situation sort of thing where there's like no clear right answer, but it leads to interesting debates in the class. And that was, that was kind of fun for me. Yeah. And I guess, you know, in robotics where, you know, it can be dangerous, you know, it makes sense to make sure you have a grounding in that kind of thing. I don't know how often you have to think about the trolley problem in your work, but I would imagine that. I mean, you if know, you're working you on self-driving cars, you probably do. Yeah. Cause you have the passenger versus people outside or whatever. Yeah. It, it is interesting. Um, yeah. Or you have I to like pull over, hundred. but there's somebody in the emergency lane, like parked or something. I don't know. Like, you could yeah. Have yeah. To I'm not that. an expert on that. So like, I'm not sure. Exactly. Yeah, I'm not either. Like, uh, Send all complaints to podcast at SKA.solutions. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, for sure. Like it, it, I feel like those situations do come up and I don't know when I talk to the people in self-driving, I feel like they've got the most interesting examples of like, you know, like here's, you know, a real um, ethical dilemma that, you know, we face at work, which is like, you know, and like, what are the consequences if you're wrong? Like, one of them that seemed kind of interesting to me is like, I'm told that like, and this is going to sound kind of bad, but like a baby is like a similar shape to like an empty plastic bag. And mm -hmm. one of those you should run over and one of those you should not run over. Right. And so it's, right. I don't know, like an interest, like maybe it's not like an ethical problem, but it's like a problem where like the probability of a baby being on the highway is very, very low. But the consequences of getting that classification wrong are very, very, very high. And right. so, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And I mean, that's something that we see in computer vision, like on the AI side of things where, you know, this is less dramatic, but you hear like, I really want to detect these rare cases. But by definition, these rare cases are like a needle in the haystack. And how do I actually get the model to learn about something that doesn't happen very often? Like if I want to detect that the Northern Lights is happening outside my house, you know, like most of the time I cannot see it perhaps depending on where I live. And yeah. so how do you actually get it to learn that this thing could happen? And it's an interesting problem. That is an interesting. How do you do that without um, like dumbing down the model or, or kind of ruining it as it were? Because I feel like if you're trying to force an outcome, like I've, I've seen it like not really a lot since school, but I feel like, you know, we had these research projects and like you, you got weird results if you were like looking for a result before you started. Yeah, I think that, you know, like obviously you'll want to find examples of a Northern Lights situation in your training. Because if you've never trained on it at all, then obviously it's not going to know. You're not going to know what you're um, looking at. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, one proxy you can have for like an event that you haven't seen before would be just seeing that like the confidence of 
your model is like a lot lower than normal, that can be a trigger that you might want to take a look that something new has happened. Um, I also think that like as you're, you know, retraining on data that your devices are seeing in reality, you need good tools that can help you, you know, go through that haystack and find the needles. And so we think that there's going to be a lot of application for vision transformers there as well, where someone can say something like, I want to find, you know, cases where, I don't know, like my cat ran across the room or like whatever your model, whatever you're trying to find in your data. And you can actually use AI, not just to execute models, but also to help you sift through your training data and find rare cases or weird cases or cases that look similar to each other. And maybe you just label one of them and then all of the cases in that cluster can be used for training now with much less human intervention. So I think that using AI in order to help you deal with your data problems is going to be a major part of the approach because in reality, people spend most of the time dealing with their data problems. Just annotating like manually, you mean, and fixing yeah. that annotations. Annotating, we're finding it. Like I've heard of people who only train on synthetic data because it is so difficult to sift through the massive amounts of data that their fleet generates that finding those needle in a haystack cases from that massive set of data is just so hard that they'd rather synthetically generate it. That kind of makes sense. I always get paranoid with synthetic data, though. Like, I'm always worried it's, like, not going to work in the real world. I don't know. And maybe that's yeah, just I mean, me, again, being, like, out of date right? Yeah. It just depends on how good the synthetic data yeah, is, I guess. It's getting accurate. better and better and better. Yeah, and I think that, like, that's part of the reason that I think that we need, like, an agile approach to these models, too, where it can't just be, like, you build it in isolation, deploy it, and then you're done you have to continually refine it based on how it's working in reality. And without that, it's never going to be super accurate. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. But I think that it is cool what we can do with synthetic data. Like, you know, I, I've heard of cases where people are putting like fog in their images and stuff like that in order to like simulate a foggy condition. And then the model can learn how to handle that. That's inter turn the radar on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, synthetic data is super cool and definitely has a place for sure. And I think that, you know, like all of this stuff, it just needs to get a lot easier to build and run these models. And then we're going to see a lot more adoption of them. And I think that like right now it's kind of funny because these language models, which used to be so far behind computer vision, now seem like they're so far ahead. And so the computer vision side of things needs to catch up a little bit. And there's all these use cases that seem so bad until like ChatGPT did it well. Like, you know, I remember every time I would see a chat bot, I would be like, oh God, this is useless. I need to talk to a person. Now, when I see a chat bot, I test if it has ChatGPT or some LLM behind it. And if it does, I'm actually more than happy to use it because it can actually understand what I'm talking about. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's probably better than a lot of people would be with that with that technology. Yeah, and so it wasn't actually a problem with chatbots. It was a problem with the fact that the models just weren't good enough yet. Yeah, yeah. Chatbots, legacy chatbots. That's right. Not, not current chatbots. Those are cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, Clippy is cool again. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. I was watching the uh, Star Trek The Lower Decks last night, and there was that badgy character, so I just... Uh, in my head, I was kind of giggling about that. Uh, did you ever read? Uh, did you ever read um, the Diamond Age? Uh, no. Who's that by? Uh, by Neil Stevenson. Oh, cool. Um, uh, in in it, there's this like book that the protagonist reads. She's like a young girl, and it basically is this tablet that teaches her anything based on like what she asks about, oh, that's and she cool. can say like, "Oh, tell me a story, or do this, or do that," and it'll like you know, basically it'll use AI to like generate whatever she's asking for. And I remember reading it 10 years ago and being like, wow, that would be amazing. But I can't imagine how this could be possible. And a relatively short time later, we're seeing it. Yeah, yeah it totally exists now. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, I was going to say it's kind of like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? Because it's this thing you carry around that can teach you about things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and right. I think we're going to see it for like a lot of things. Like, 
if you ever look at sci-fi, they're always using like interfaces that are so perfectly designed for whatever use case the character has in that moment. And that always struck me as super unrealistic because, you know, we're so used to these like very static interfaces for the technology we interact with. But I think that like in the future, we'll see those interfaces be auto-generated as well, depending on the use case in the moment. If it could adapt to what it needed to do. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting concept. I, I've not really thought about that, but it makes sense. Yeah, so I think it's like super exciting, you know, all this stuff that is going to happen now. I mean, I know there's a lot of hype around it, but, um, you know, For I sure think there that... is, but it's also impressive as hell. I mean, you know. Yeah, I feel like ChatGPT is the new Google where like if all the things you search for on Google got aired, it'd be kind of embarrassing. And then it's like ChatGPT. <laughs> it's now like just what trying to get it to say something like that. Wait, say again. Now it's like, why does my cat's litter box look like that? Or whatever, maybe <laughs> not air to the public. My, my, I feel like my chat GPT is just me trying to get it to like make raps in the style of Benjamin Franklin or like. Oh, nice. I, I'm still in that phase where I'm just like trying to see like what it can do and amuse my friends at parties. <laughs> or like at dinners. Right. Yeah, yeah it, it's really like, it's really interesting, like what it's good at right now, what it's not. And I think that like it's just going to keep getting better. Obviously, yeah, yeah for sure. Are you, and the uh, open source is going to be interesting as well. Yeah, no, I think that is interesting. And then I, I've heard, and you'd know more about this than me, but I've heard like something that's kind of big coming up, and and maybe we're even starting to see already. And my knowledge is just a little behind is like uh, small language models. So like the idea mm -hmm. that you can put it on like an embedded device or you know, something on the edge and you can have a conversation with like, you know, an inanimate object basically. And it's, it's animate now, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that like the concept of distilling a really general and smart model to a very task specific small model that's optimized for whatever environment it's in, you know, that concept we're going to see play out in a lot of domains. And you're totally right because maybe your edge device, it doesn't actually need to know everything that a traditional LLM knows. It just needs to know something very specific. Like I want to set a timer or something like that. Like, I don't know, you know, what the exact use case would be or like turn on my light or whatnot. And, you know, that's how we can basically, you know, bring those smaller use cases to life more quickly by having these mentor models that it can learn from. For sure. When the example someone gave me that was like creepy but interesting was like being able to have like a deep philosophical conversation with like a kid's doll or something that was like designed right. yeah, and just yeah, like not connected like to the some, internet. There's some car company that like their dealers were using ChatGPT in the background or something. So people were using it to get free access to ChatGPT4 to basically like chat with this like, oh, that's I don't know exactly what the car was, but yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting like having to make sure that like, you know, if you are using these types of very, very broad models, like how do you ensure that they stay constrained to your use case and that it can't get like escaped out of to the more general capabilities? And I think that's where smaller models can definitely come in, right? Where you use these large models to basically generate labeled data for free but then the small model actually has like much more narrow capability than that yeah i mean i guess the other way to do it would be to have the large model but fence it in so you're like you know i don't know anything about that thing you asked me about which it yeah. seems like the large models already do because i mean i don't know if you're anything like me you've tried to get it to say things that are off color or like do things that i think everybody's done this right i think that's why they don't ban your account for doing that is because it's just natural human curiosity to be like, oh, I wonder if I can get it to say something politically incorrect or I wonder if, you know, I can get it to write a dirty limerick. And it's like, nope, it, it looks like the developers thought of that already and it won't do that. So Right, right. But it's like, it yeah. definitely has the capability. I mean, because of all the other things, it's just, you know, there's there's a heuristic. Yeah, and it's just funny how like easy it is to anthropomorphize it too because I think there was something that was saying like, oh, ChatGPT is like lazier in December. And like, I thought that that was like made up, but then someone looked into it and was like, yeah, if you prompt it that it's May versus December, it generates outputs that are like shorter or something like that. Huh. That's, and I'm not that's like an really interesting in that, but yeah, like there's so much potential for anthropomorphizing here that it can be hard not to sometimes like, 
Well, people you know, were definitely lazier in it. December. So I wonder if that's just there was like less content to glom onto because people were checked out, you know, for the holidays or whatever. I mean, there's even evidence that like telling it that you'll give it a $200 tip will increase its performance. But like, how is it going to collect that tip? It won't. But the thing oh, is, is that it, in the context that it's learned, like it has associated that with an incentive, you know, yeah, it's, it's strange. Like I would That's never have predicted these types of emergent behaviors. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's just so much to try that we haven't even tried yet. Yeah, for sure. Well, and I'm sure like the tech is going to be getting better and better. I mean, you're right. It is like one of the crowning achievements of humanity so far that like we've been able to make that work, you know, as a species. I can't take any credit for it, but I like Oh, that. no, me neither. But I will say I've benefited from it where sometimes I'm just like, you know, sometimes I find like I'm trying to use like some new library or something like that, like when I'm coding and it's something I'm just not that familiar with. For example, like um, I'm, I'm I learned Tailwind, which is a you know, it helps you write CSS basically. Oh, cool. Okay. No, and I'm, so I'll just be like, that. oh yeah, it makes it a lot easier. And so then I'll just be like, how do I like center this thing with, you know, this behavior, blah, 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 and tailwind. And then it'll just tell me, or nice. I'll be like, why is not this working? Like, this is not showing up right. Copy and paste. And it'll be like, you need to edit your CSS class to be a line center or whatever, you know, the situation is. That's and pretty amazing it, actually. It's it really helps productivity. Like almost every software engineer I know is using it now because it seems can just... to be the case. I think certain companies are like banned from using it because they're worried about like Microsoft or like OpenAI getting access to their queries. So yeah. like I, I, I don't want to name names, but I have friends that work for other big tech companies that like are prohibited from using chat GPT at work. And it's... I guarantee you that people are still using them. Most likely. Yeah. I mean, people are using this stuff like for homework. Well, They're think, using it. I think some of these companies are providing like their own, you know, like llama based, you know, like chat bots or whatever, just to give people an alternative internally that they can use. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how like the propri proprietary versions of those models, you know, turn out where like you can have like, you know, chat GPT, but trained on your company's specific data. So if I want to know like how to get into like, this machine to rerun my Jenkins test or something, it can tell me specifically. Whereas something general like ChatGPT wouldn't necessarily know. The other thing that's like funny about these models is like, it's not just like in a lot of cases, it's not just one model, but we that's kind of conceptualize it as one. Because can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, and I, I can't speak to ChatGPT specifically, but like in AI, you know, there's this concept of like a mixture of experts where you say like, I don't know exactly like i i might have models that are really good at certain things but not others so like let's take an example where i have a model that i need to detect animals you know in the wilderness or something like that perhaps i might have one that is specialized for small animals and one that's specialized for large animals i might also have one that's specialized for like you know nighttime versus daytime and oh, you can basically yeah, it is interesting. And you can bring all these together and almost like treat them as one model and just run it through all of them. And actually underneath the hood, it might be different models, but then you can kind of like merge the results and then get an even better result than each one independently. So it's almost like simultaneously amazing and also a kludge at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like if you have a question and you have a lawyer friend, a doctor friend and an engineer friend, you can just like ask, ask all of them, all of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and then maybe just average the, their answers. <laughs> and if it's a legal question, maybe you take the lawyer friend more a little seriously. More <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you can actually like have algorithms to decide like how much weight to give each of these experts. What's funny is I have actually seen that at work on, um, you know, robotics based machine learning um, where like, I don't want to get too into detail, so I'm not giving away anyone's anything, but, you know, just a bunch of different models being queried and, and averaged together or, like, certain parts being factored in at the end. Like, it's it's interesting how, like, the real world just goes with whatever works rather than whatever is tidy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I feel like AI is, like, a perfect example of that where we're doing all these, like, massive transformations on matrices, basically, and it can produce wild results that you would never expect 
that kind of computation to be able to produce. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, you brought up an interesting point earlier, which is just, um, you know, being able to figure out like, you know, the connotation of a sentence or something like, is this positive or negative? Right. Like, you know, is, is, can you detect sarcasm? Like, I, I mean, I'm sure you can now, like it, it you know, it's, yeah. it, it can do it, you know? <laughs> and so, I mean, those are pretty complex, um, concepts where I feel like if you were to try to do that classically, like you, you wouldn't be able to. Yeah. Because I think the thing is, is like our brains too. It's not like we have these perfect if else statements where it's like, Oh, you use this word. Therefore it's sarcastic. Right. Yeah. All these things are like so contextual and it can be hard for us to even describe how we know something was sarcastic. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything you want to close with or plug on the way out? Um, I think the thing I'd like to plug is like, if people have, um, you know, projects where they want to run computer vision models in edge environments, we'd love to learn from you about what you're trying to do. Sweet. How, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, the best way to get a hold of me is probably on LinkedIn. Um, just send me a request and, uh, just put a little message that you saw, you know, this podcast and, uh, that's the best way. Sweet. Awesome. Well, Natalie, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun and I hope to do it again soon. Yeah. Thanks, Spencer. My pleasure. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at www.ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you